here um, this beautiful day. Um, I'm Jennifer DeVere Brody. I chair the Department of Theater and Performance Studies here, and I also work in comparative studies of race and ethnicity and in African American studies. And it's just wonderful that you're here for this special talk celebration of the brand new six month old uh, new Anderson collection. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome our special guest. Um, Professor Kelly Jones, and before I tell you a little bit um, about her, in case you don't know, I want to just thank, uh, again, our wonderful sponsors for this celebration, especially the um, curator of the collection, Jason Manitsky, and also Amy Shapiro, uh, both of the Anderson Collection, and Jamie, who's filming today. Uh, I also want to thank the Stanford Arts Institute, particularly Matthew Tews and Emily Seidel, who called for proposals from individual faculty and uh, awarded me one so that I could bring uh, people here for this lovely space. I also want to thank my colleagues and staff, Jet, uh, Patrice O'Dwyer, Janet Panetta, Caitlin Fong, Stephanie Okuda, and Rebecca Ormiston, who's really been instrumental in helping to advertise and make this possible, as well as Shelley Fister Fishkin in American Studies, the Dean of Humanities and Sciences, the Associate Dean Deborah Sachs, uh, Samuel Lean of African and African American Studies, and Jose David Salivar of CSRA also lent support. So Dr. Jones is a professor of the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University and one of the nation's foremost authorities on contemporary art in the African diaspora, including Latino and Latina arts and artifacts. She's a stellar curator, a superb writer about visual and other arts, as evident from her awards, such as a grant from the Creative Capital, Warhol Foundation, the Terror Museum of American Art. Uh, she's also been recognized for curatorial work by Art Forum and the International Association of Art Critics. Dr. Jones's original and brilliant book, I Minded, uh, Living and Writing in Contemporary Art, which came out from Duke University Press, and we'll show you that beautiful, she says she loves this purple color, but this gives you a sense of how amazing and um, substantial this book is. And it includes contributions from her illustrious family, Amiri Baraka, Hetty Jones, Lisa Jones, and Guthrie Ramsey, Jr. Uh, and we were having a conversation as we were touring the Anderson Collection, just about that this is also uh, a family collection of art and that through line of thinking about our interlocutors for art and the close associations, especially around multimedia, I think will be evident in her talk and very important to her aesthetic and the way she conceptualizes uh, the arts in general. Okay. Um, as Dr. Elizabeth Alexander, who was here not too long ago in this very podium, also in celebration of the Anderson Collection said, of I Minded, it reveals Kelly Jones as a discerning architect of the multicultural landscape and is informed by her keen eye and incisive intellect. For me, I Minded is a unique book that is a beacon of intergenerational and interdisciplinary artwork. As she writes in the introduction, Art in the Family, appropriately titled, she wants to think about how art objects and the activities around their making and display in exhibitions, homes, and studios as well as their materiality and life are integral to forming relationships and kinship among sometimes diverse constituencies. And I think that really does encapsulate the appropriateness for this uh, particular family collection here. Dr. Jones does this in all her work, and I admire her for it. Um, it is both her ethic and aesthetic. In an appropriately glowing review of her show Witness, Art and Civil Rights in the 60s, which ran at the Brooklyn Museum from March 7th through July 13th of last year, and we can only think about how prescient it was given the events of uh, Ferguson and everything that happened in 2014, and this continues to happen around the um, uh, sort of loss of civil rights and for black subjects in particular. Uh, Isaiah Wooden, a tax student um, in my department, wrote that Miss, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn challenges the illogics of white supremacy and racial violence, and it is this song that reverberates through Jones's curatorial work to cross the various photos, paintings, sculptures, graphics, music, and videos that are presented in the exhibition, um, which had tons of work and has gotten wonderful work. It was part of the Pacific Standard time as well. Um, that's another piece that she did, Now We Did, so another piece of her curatorial work in LA. Um, we're very happy to welcome her back to the West Coast, and uh, I also just want to 
say that she has a new book coming out on conceptual art and Latino art that she's researching right here at Stanford's collection. So it's wonderful to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Jo. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that great introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for bringing me here so I could uh, continue to work in that wonderful archive over at Green Library. Um, and I'd also uh, like to thank everybody at the Anderson Collection, but also my great family for coming here. A lot of family, and they always, uh, what makes <coughs> my life great in terms of my professional life when I do shows or talks, my family always shows up. So, uh, you know, when you do something that seems arcane like art history, that may not be the case. So I'm always glad uh, to welcome the Greens, and especially I'd like to dedicate this talk to my great aunt, uh, Elise Jones Martin, who's here. So thank you very much. In 1963, so the story goes, David Hammonds set out from Springfield, Illinois in his car. When it broke down 25 miles outside of town, he repaired it, but didn't return the few short miles back home. Instead, he kept going, determined at all costs to keep heading west and to his destination of Los Angeles. Hammonds was like many artists heading from the countryside, small town, or regional city to the sprawling metropolis, drawn as much to the adventures there as to the locale of culture and avant-garde activity. In the mid-20th century, others of his generation also headed west from the mid-regions of the United States. Bruce Nauman, born Fort Wayne, Indiana, Ed Ruscha, born Omaha, Nebraska, and Judy Chicago, born Chicago, all sought to stake a claim in the Los Angeles art game. They studied art and began showing their work there in the early 1960s, as the city came into its own as a major cultural capital. What differentiates Hammond's story from these others to a certain degree is its implication in another narrative. It is a tale to be sure of a larger African American community in Los Angeles in the same period. Like Hammond's, Charles White, born Chicago, John Otterbridge, born Greenfield, North Carolina, Noah Purifoy, born, born Snow Hill, Alabama, and Sengen Ngudi, born Chicago, made their way to California as adults or as children. Those born in Los Angeles, like Betty Saar, were the children of people who had made that same journey. What is significant about this seemingly simple, almost unnoticeable fact, is its tie to the much larger, two-century-long narrative of black migrants. African-American migration in the 19th and 20th century was nothing less than black people willing into existence their presence in modern American life. It represents their resolve to make a new world in the aftermath of human bondage and stake their claim in the United States. It is a narrative that stretches 100 years forward from the moment of freedom, a tale with a genesis in southern climes that then moved north and west, and it is a tale of the role of place in that claim, particularly the role of the west as a site of possibility, peace, and utopia. Artists such as Hammonds, like most African Americans in the 20th century, were part of this massive relocation of people in some way. My goal here is to understand and demonstrate how their work speaks to the dislocations and cultural reinvention of migration, its materials of loss and of possibility, and sense of reinscription of the new in style and practice. Between 1910 and 1970, more than six and a half million African Americans left the southern United States for points north and west in what has been called the Great Migration, one of the largest and fastest internal migrations in history. Such movement, even when self-propelled, was often not just a one-time or permanent thing. There was the notion of crisscrossing, as the historian Darlene Clark Pine has posited. forward and backward, but not relentless and linear, due to factors such as the scrutiny of black movement, lack of capital, the need to care for relatives left behind, and keeping in touch with home. In the notion of crisscross, we find as well Michelle Baserteau's notion of ellipsis, the gap in spatial continuum, 
a journey whose synecdochic movements nevertheless comprise the semblance of a whole. In the 20th century, African Americans headed west via car, train, or bus, but in the 19th century, they walked. As Hines as Hine reminds us, quote, blacks challenged with their feet the boundaries of freedom, end quote. Similarly, de Certeau engaged the figure of the walker, the person on the ground who rearticulates and reinscribes the city-state in her own image, a migrational force all but invisible on the city plan, outside the panoptic power of the grid. For de Certeau, walking implies the rhetoric of the pedestrian speech act, which appropriates the topographical and offers a rhetoric of alternate social relations, connecting positions on the map that are unexpected in the dominant cartographic imagination. The walker is the dreamer in search of her own true and proper form. The walker exits from the prescribed geographic plan and in doing so reconfigures it, improvising, inventing something new. Black migrations were spatial movements, bodies creating new paths to selfhood and enfranchisement. Migrations then are motion and action. The articulation of new routes away from a feudal past and toward a modern future. As initiated by African Americans, these activities look to find places where people thrive. They are gestures that inscribe the world for emergence, growth, the renovation of self, and a revision of citizenship. These are assertions of space, cultural or political, as land or property, and create place, whether actual sites in the world or positions in the global imagination. Yet such affirmative declarations of location are also matched by their inversions. The negative valences of segregation, apartness, constriction, refusal. The history of segregation in the United States is more than juridical restraint. It was the separation of black and white bodies accomplished through physical and spatial acts that enforced partition, imposed division, and rationalized and made real a dysfunctional inequality. As much as migration was spatial claim, segregation was the denial of space, both intellectual and physical. As migrants made their way west, they